in the relationship that we have with God, we have responsibilities as believers, as deacons, as ministers, as Christians, as brothers and sisters of Christ. What is our responsibility? Work, worry, or worship. You know if the truth was told, which ones we do the most. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a minute to repent, as I've already done. Think about which one of these three you find yourself doing the most. You know worship is not relegated to Sunday morning at 830, right? Which of these three do we do the most? This morning from the book of James, I almost said Luke, I want to... Remind us of our responsibility in our relationship with God. Since we are in relationship with God, we need to know who does what. As it relates to working, worrying, or worshiping. For many people, they think it's their responsibility uh, to work things out I'm convicting myself, when <laughs> we find ourselves in trouble. I thought it was my job to, to work my way from being stuck in one city and another city and to get to St. Martin. It was my responsibility. And I, I told my wife, watch back. I, I'm going to work this out. I know people who know people and, and <laughs> we're going to get there. <laughs> uh, for many other people, they think it's their job to worry, hold on now, until things work themselves out during a trial. I've got to tell you, I, I moved from trying to work things out to worrying about how things are going to work out as it relates to getting here. When I found myself in a conundrum, I, I was trying to work it out. I was, I was trying to worry it out. And, and, and it didn't happen until I realized I couldn't, I couldn't be successful with either one. I began <laughs> to worship. And when I realized that God was sovereign and God was in control and, and that he, he, it was his plans. It, it was my plans, but it was, his, it was his purposes for us to be where we were when we were. And I gave up trying to work it out. I gave up trying to worry it out. And my wife and I on the beaches of San Juan, Puerto Rico, just worshiped it out. <laughs> Listen, it is clear as to what our responsibility is in this unique relationship that we have with God. Our responsibility, though many of us try the other two, our responsibility is simply what we did this morning, to worship him. And our worship should not be without enthusiasm. Our worship should not be a falsification. Our worship should not be a show or put on. Our, our worship should be authentic and real and genuine and born out of Scripture. What I'm discovering is then the body of Christ is that everyone knows what work and worry looks like. Ask the person next to you. They, they know what trying to work things out look like. They know what worrying about things look like. But, but what many folk are missing and what everybody don't know is how the worship of God is supposed to look like. And that's our responsibility in regards to our relationship with God. I do a little something at our church and it's for the benefit of those of you who watched too much TV last night and will probably go to sleep before I finish. Uh, I, I, I ask from time to time during the sermon for you to repeat a word or a phrase 
so that, you know, like when you're watching a movie, when you wake up near the end and you act like you've been watching the whole movie, you'll kind of know how it closes. And so the word I want is not going to make sense until the end of the message. But if you just repeat the word fireproof, fireproof, amen, fireproof. Yeah, from time to time, we'll wake you up and actually just say fireproof. The word worship has to do with paying homage or ascribing worth, if you will, to someone or to something. And of course, you know, our someone and our something is Jesus Christ. So being a joyful worshiper of God is having a proper reverential fear, if you will, of God. And it's combined with your understanding of the characteristics of God. And not only his characteristics, but because you understand his characteristics and his attributes, you have great gratitude toward God. As a result, obedience permeates from your life. Prayer is born out of that. And, and you live your life simply with the desire to glorify God. Even when you're stuck in San Juan, Puerto Rico. That's what makes worship, worship. The recognized celebration of God for who he is and what he has done. To put it another way, worship is all that I'm paying homage to all that God is. Worship is our joyful reflection of God's worth. That's what those songs were about this morning. Our joyful reflection of God's worth. Worship is the recognizing of God as God in spite of whatever we're going through. Worship comes as a result of a mind that overflows from the truth that we know about God. Now, you, 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 you missed that because uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were in Rwanda, Africa, and I was sitting around with some professors and theologians, and, and, and somehow, Pastor, that was a, an, a discussion about, you know, your truth, my truth, and, you know, my opinion, your opinion. And, and, and once they gave me a moment to speak, I, I ran off about 18 scriptures in the Bible where, you know, Jesus Christ said, he is the way, the life, and the truth. Let me help you out this morning. And you, this will settle all arguments. Truth is not a position that you take about the Bible. Truth is a person. You miss what I just said. 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 Truth is not a position that you take on something about the Bible. Truth is a person. And y'all know who the person is, right? <laughs> Woo! No, the person is Jesus Christ. That's what truth is. So when you hear me say this morning, huh, Worship comes from a mind overflowing with the truth about God. I ain't talking about soteriology. I ain't talking about theology. I ain't talking about hermitology. I'm talking about the person, Jesus Christ. When I think of oh, all he's done for me, the only thing that flows from me is the worship of God. That's the truth, the whole truth. Nothing but the truth. Everybody say fireproof, fireproof. When God is not recognized as God in the life of a believer, he's not being worshipped. And when God is not being worshipped, it's because someone, are you ready for this, is trying to work things out on their own. Ouch. When God is not being worshipped, or being recognized as God, what has happened is worry and anxiety is ruining the relationship of the believer or, or what he should be thinking in regards to God. That's why even Jesus Christ said that worry and anxiety is a sin. Hmm. Can you imagine what the Psalms 
would have sound like if there were no worship of God found in the Psalms. If, if we were to extract the worship of God in the Psalms, can you imagine what they would sound like? Matter of fact, 90 of the 150 Psalms, they tell us why we should be worshiping God. And then the last seven Psalms from, uh, uh, tells us uh, 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 how we should be worshiping God. And so imagine the Psalms without the worship of God in them. I know you can't imagine it, so let me help you imagine. <laughs> imagine the 23rd Psalm written by someone who's full of worry. Imagine the 23rd Psalm written by someone who believed that it was their responsibility to work with God to ensure their own salvation. You're familiar with the 23rd Psalm, right? Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Well, see, David had worship on his heart, but, but here's how it would have sound if David did not have worship of God on his heart. And like Paul says in the New Testament, I beg with you a little indulgence with me here. This is what the 23rd Psalm would sound like with work and worry added and worship eliminated. Here's the 23rd Psalm, my bolsterized version of it. The Lord is my shepherd, but I still have things to worry about. When we agree upon a place that is suitable for us both, I lay down, but I don't rest. Mm. When we spend the most of our day looking for quiet waters, God goes one way and I go another way. Any of y'all ever had to help God out? God and I, we feed off of each other. This is the 23rd Psalm. Sometimes I make the Lord feel good and sometimes he makes me feel good. We keep each other on the right path because both of our reputations are at stake. Even when we are in a tough spot together, neither one of us are scared because we have each other to depend on. I probably depend upon him more than he depends on me, and that's because he carries a big stick. Y'all missed that. Thy rod and thy staff, I find comfort in them. Even though my days are difficult, Somehow, by the end of every day, I realized together he and I have provided for me felicity and some certainties, even in the presence of my known enemies, and that makes me feel good. Last verse of the 23rd Psalm, with work and worry added and worship eliminated, it would read like this. So when I come to the end of my life on earth and find myself just where I plan to go in the first place, my father's house, which is in heaven, I'm going to look back over my life and I'm going to remember what we, God and me, accomplished together. And I'll think about that throughout all eternity. That's the 23rd Psalm with worship eliminated. But the two things we probably do the most, work and worry added. Everybody say fireproof. In the, I like the book of James for many reasons. Outside of, I was telling them earlier, it is the earliest written book in the New Testament. The, the book of James was written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The book of James is a book that teaches Christians, especially leaders and men in the church, uh, how to what? Conduct ourselves. 
And certainly on the heels of the ordination, uh, 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 we uh, who are ministers and deacons need to know how to conduct ourselves. But the members in the church need to know why we conduct ourselves the way we conduct ourselves so that you can be models of just how we conduct ourselves. The book of James doesn't just talk to us about faith alone. James tells us how we should function and conduct ourselves. When I read the book of James, it seems as if James is personally and directly asking me uh, such questions as these. In other words, Mike, what benefit would it be for you to have a faith that is dead and useless? Mike, what benefit do you get out of being angry? Why? Because the angry of a man, the anger of a man does not achieve what? The righteousness of God. That's in the book of James. Mike, what benefit is there in having a relationship with God if your responsibilities are going to include working and worry? I hope you're getting this. Our responsibility as it relates to our salvation is not to work with God to acquire it, but to worship God for the work he's already done for us to acquire it. God is not looking for partnership with us. And that's what throws us off a lot of time. We, we thank God want to be partners. God is not looking for any type of partnership with us. God's desire is to have, and we saw it right there in verse 1, a master-servant relationship, a, a master-slave relationship with us. That, that's God's desire. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because when you're in a partnership, you expect your partner to work and worry along with you. Think about that for a minute. If you were in some type of business or whatever like that and, and you're in partnership with it and, and the business in trouble, then you want your partner to, 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 to help you work things out or at least to worry along with you. But God is not our partner. If God is our master, then you understand that as his servant, our primary responsibility is to worship him, not to worry or to work. God expects us to worship, he, he, and he wants that worship joyfully and genuinely. If a person gets caught up in what their responsibilities are, they will unintentionally ruin their relationship with God. I saw that creeping in as I was trying to work things out and worry about things. I, I saw how I was beginning to, to pull the strands that held our relationship together because I didn't understand what he was doing and, and I thought it was my job to worry about it. Hmm. Also, if a person's left to think that either work or worry is their responsibility in their relationship with God, they will soon grow disenchanted. They'll grow disenchanted with their lives when they truly discover, and here it is, that they have no control over their lives at all. That's what worry leaves us. So let's look at this verse in James chapter 1. James chapter 1, uh, verse 2. I was telling pastor, man, I would love to preach through uh, verse 9, but it'd probably take me to Wednesday night. So I'm going to just preach through verse 2. James chapter 1 Verse 2 say, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Well, the first thing we must recognize in this verse, since God commands us believers to do this, he commands us to do this, that means he has given us what? The ability to do it. Mm. If God commands us to do a thing, he has given us the ability to do it. Let me say that again. I think people often miss that. If God commands believers to do something that he knows we cannot do, then he would be wrong for commanding us to do it and expecting it. And God is never wrong. But since God commands us to be joyful, to worship him, even when we're experiencing various trials, that means, are y'all getting this? That he has already given us the ability to do it. 
<laughs> it wasn't until I realized I had the ability to rejoice in San Juan, Puerto Rico, that I began to rejoice in San Juan, Puerto Rico. See, if God demands something of us, he's given us the ability to do it. For every vision that God gives a man, he makes provisions. <laughs> Somebody asked me why. I'm glad you asked, because he don't want you to take credit for it. <laughs> uh, listen, all worship that is acceptable to God, it is only energized by the Spirit of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can't come in here and play the right chords or the right beat, the right notes, or, or sit something that make you rock side to side and sway like you out there, you know. Uh, no, 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 no. It, it, the, to worship God properly can only be energized by the Spirit of God. God's goal for salvation is to produce true worshipers, not just any type of worshipers. So when a Christian is not living this James 1 and 2 type of life, it is an affront to God. It's an insult to God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? If, if you are not counting all joy when you consider all very trial, you are an insult to God's goodness towards you. Now, if that's difficult for you to understand, for those of you who are parents or grandparents or whatever, you know, when we bless our children and, and, and they don't respond the type of way we think they should respond, it insults us, doesn't it? Because we know what we went through to provide that for them. They think you just go in the store, pull it off the shelf, and as my granddaughter, the young one, say, use the credit card, Poppy, use the credit card. As if it's no limits on those. And so, and so, when we don't give the right type of response, it's an insult, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, to God. How a Christian responds to things show what they really value. Listen, if we value comfort more than character, did you get that? If we, you know, value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical things of life more than we value the spiritual things of life, we will not be able to count our trials all joy. If we live only for the present, meaning now on earth, and forget the future later in heaven, our trials will make us bitter and not better. Because mm. we're living to satisfy ourselves here right now on earth. Everybody say fireproof. If as a Christian we cannot rejoice in our trials, our values are not godly or biblical, and our view of God is wrong. God is not a God who exempts us from trials. God is a God who keeps us when we get in trials. You understand what I'm saying? God is, he's not a God who keeps us from trouble. He's a God who keeps us when we get in trouble. I want to highlight two words in this verse, the word when and the word various. When in this verse, uh, it is what's called in the subject, subjunctive mood. Uh, in other words, it carries an idea of inevitability and not just a possibility. You get what I'm saying? So it's not, it's not if. Is when. <laughs> it's inevitable, in other words, ladies and gentlemen. It, it's not, it's not, oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying. It, it, it's, it's not maybe you're going to encounter trials of uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. It, it's not maybe. It, you know, it's, mm, it, 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 and see, we keep getting duped and fooled by prosperity preachers saying, you know, that life is supposed to be just joyful and prosperous. Y'all, it's not if. Is when. Remember, I told you James is the early written book of the New Testament. This could be written before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so God moved on the heart of Jesus' brother to make sure that he let us know, y'all, in the second verse. Y'all hear what I said. The second verse in the New Testament book, 
says we're going to have troubles. <laughs> In other words, not just any kind of trouble, but various troubles. Various trials are certain to come to you and I as children of God. And we should expect them as part of living a godly life in, in a God-forsaken place. Pay close attention because this verse also tells us even in times of trials and testing, our responsibility, watch this, y'all, should remain the same. Even in times of trials and testing, our responsibility to worship God we still have that responsibility. Wow, wow. We're to worship God and not try to work with God. We're to worship God, but, but, but let him do the work in and through us, as I think Romans eleven thirty six 36 would tell us, for his glory. That word various, James' point with the use of this word is that the trials uh, we encounter will come in many different shapes, shades, sizes, degrees, and forms. In other words, James said, don't try and distinguish one trial or test from the other because they're going to come in many different shapes, forms, sizes, and degrees. Matter of fact, uh, sometimes a trial may begin with one thing, shift to another thing, <laughs> and end up a totally different thing. <laughs> You hear what I'm saying? You know, it started like this, then it gravitated to this, and before we knew it, we were here, and next thing you know, we're all over here. Various shapes, forms, and sizes. It just started with the fact that they just ignored you. Then the thought went in your mind. Hmm. And then from that thought, went something else. And then from that, it moved to slander. And then it moved from slander to some gossip. And from some gossip to, you, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> the trial started out that, that you know, you, 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 you lost a job, but after losing the job, then you lost something else. And then you lost something else. And then you lost something else. And before you knew it, you know, you forgot that all of this started by just that. But he says we ought to count it all joy and all very, you know, count it joy when you got the job and you still got to count it joy and worship God even if you lose the job. Our response to everything must be the same. Our response to our trials reflect our spiritual condition. Hear me, newly uh, uh, ordained deacons and ministers. Our response to trials reflect our spiritual condition. I don't need somebody I'm going to help for. When I go to help for them, they seem overwhelmed by the question that I ask them. Our spiritual condition reflects, our response reflects our spiritual condition. In the Bible days, if a king or a person of high notary was to be found running, <laughs> they considered the whole town, the whole nation in trouble if they saw the king running. And that's why kings couldn't run there outside of being dignified and all of that. But if, 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 if you see the king running, running. <laughs> That means the whole nation and tribe is in trouble. And so leaders, ministers, and deacons, as we serve this body, uh, we, we, you got to remember what our responsibility reflects our spiritual condition. So how we serve based on whatever happens, that, that tells the body that we are trusting God, we're, we're worshiping God, that the God, that he's going to handle the work, he's going to handle the worry. We just need to what? Worship. Everybody say fireproof. Listen, working and worrying only makes sense to folk, watch this now, who don't have true God on a relationship with God. Amen. If you can't say that, you can say out. Working and worrying only makes sense to folk 
who don't have a true God on a relationship with God. I've been around folk before and, and they saw how my response, and you know, as pastor leading the church, and, and they saw my response or non-response to a situation that they thought was threatening or, or that was just gonna make everything collapse. And, and because, because I was not, you know, responding the way they wanted me to respond, I, I came to understand what they understood, why they were wearing like that, because they, in fact, did not have a true God honoring relationship with God. If you're going through something alone without God, then you need to wear it. Because your work alone won't be sufficient. I don't know if you hear what I just said. <laughs> if you're going through something without God, you need to wear it. <laughs> because your work alone won't be sufficient. Oh, but when you go through it, with God. <laughs> James tells us we can count it all joy. If we're going through whatever we're going through with God, we can worship because, you know, uh, uh, we know Psalms 23. Uh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can withstand the trial because we know Psalms 23. In, in other words, uh, we understand that our test or trial, watch this now, mm, it's not a liability, but it is a privilege. Oh, I don't know if you heard what I said. I don't know if you heard what I said. I don't know if you heard what I said. It's better to go through trouble with God. That's a privilege. Then to try to go it alone without God, then you're liable. <laughs> if you're going through it with God, God will be the provider. Wow. 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 Another reason when you go through the test with God, you know, ultimately, we're going to benefit. Uh, we may go through something, but ultimately, it's for our benefit. We know it's going to be beneficial and not harmful. And, and, and as a result of knowing that going through this test and trial with God is going to be beneficial and harmful, then no, no, no matter how painful it may seem, then we need to just keep on worshiping. Like Jesus and the cross, when you encounter various trials, you got to look beyond the trial. You got to look beyond the trial to the joy that you know you will have when the trial is over. In other words, when God has completed and accomplished his great and glorious work in you. I think this is what Paul meant when he said uh, uh, in his letter to the church of Philippi, he said, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself in. Paul was in essence saying, when we get, when we got to learn to look, watch this y'all, beyond what is happening, whoop, this is convicting, to what God is accomplishing. I, you maybe you didn't hear what I said, I'm saying, I'm gonna say it in another language. You gotta look beyond what is happening to see what God is accomplishing. Maybe, maybe I'm going to say it in another language. Maybe you missed what I said. You got to look beyond what is happening to you and understand whoo, what God is accomplishing through you. That's how you count it all joy. That's how you count it all joy. Mothers, you know what I'm talking about? For nine months, you, you, you look at what's happening to you. Whoo. Oh, but when the baby is delivered and God has accomplished what he's accomplished through you, no more pain, just joy. Hmm. Y'all, we got to look beyond what's happening to us, to what God is accomplishing through us. We must look beyond the trial or the test on Paul's words, even the thorn, and worship God knowing that his grace, yeah, is sufficient. <laughs> yeah, I asked him to get me out of San Juan, Puerto Rico more than three times, and he said no every time. And ultimately, I realized if I worship him and not worry, try to work it out of worship it or worry it out, 
that, that his grace well, is sufficient. Listen, leave, leaving us, God now leaves us with one responsibility of only worshiping him for the work he does. Our responsibility when we face adversity is to continue to joyfully worship God. I'll say this and I'll begin to sum this thing up. Listen, I don't know what you know, but since God has also said, and I know you're familiar with this verse, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, says that no temptation mm, has overtaken you, but that is such that is common to man. And God is what? Faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond, are you understand what I'm saying? Well, you are able, but what he will do is with that same trial, that same test, that same temptation, woo, he will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it, whatever it is. Hmm. I don't know what you hear when you hear that, but what I hear when I hear that is, watch this. When we walk with God, just like faith and works are inseparable, you, you, you understand that. Faith and works are inseparable. Uh, leaders, servants, faith and work. Don't, don't, don't just tell me you're faithful because I'm annoyed by your works. <laughs> Faith and works are inseparable. And just as faith and works are inseparable, one doesn't come without the other. Watch this now. Well, with tests, temptations, and trials, even with adversity that comes our way, God makes sure, and that's what this verse says, that with the trouble, he sends deliverance. Oh, he said, like, oh, yes, I love trouble. But I will also sin deliverance. Oh, you know, okay. See, that was some children of his, a nation that he called out, not because they were special, but because he wanted to make them special, called the children of Israel. They, they went and they were forced into slavery in Egypt. And God knew every minute that they were there. But God, with the same situation, he allowed them to be put in. He, 1 Corinthians 10 and 31, 13 them, he delivered them from that situation. Whatever situation that we get in with God or because of God or as a result of being faithful to God, God will deliver us. There's a whole line of biblical witnesses to attest to that. I'll conclude with this. This is I'm going to come back tonight. The only people who can't find joy in this verse is unbelievers. The only people who can't find joy in this verse that says, consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various other. The only people who cannot find peace or joy in this verse is unbelievers. Why? Because unbelievers can read the Bible, but they can't claim the promises of the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? They, they, unbeliever can read the Bible, but they can't claim the promises of the Bible. I, 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 you understand what I'm saying? An unbeliever can read the Bible, can quote the Bible, can preach the Bible, can teach the Bible, but they can't claim the promises of the Bible. Only believers, only those who can account it all joy. The joy that believers get can't be gotten by unbelievers. <laughs> Y'all remember that song, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. <laughs> joy is like this for the converted, but it's not like that for those who are just convinced. Mm. Yeah, there's some folk who are convinced, but they ain't converted. And only converted folk have this kind of joy, not convinced folk. 
If you think that you're going through or going to go through an inescapable trial, then you might try being worried and you might try to work things out. But you shouldn't think like that because if you go, if you are walking with God, then you know that God will deliver you from the trial. I'm going to close by reminding you of a very familiar story about three uh, Hebrew boys. I know you're familiar with them. Every time I say their name, I mess one or two up. So I'll let y'all say their name. They were in a trial. Everybody say fireproof. You see where I'm going with this? They were in a trial. They were in a test. And from the looks of things, their situation, <laughs> beyond dismal, it was, it was undeliverable. You, you don't get put in fire seven times heated up and burning don't happen. <laughs> and so from the looks of things, their situation certainly would have been grounds for worry. Yeah, yeah, no. I was, if I was a Baptist preacher right here, I, I'd do it. Uh, but, but I mean, from the looks of things, their situation, you know, it was grounds for any human being to worry. <laughs> from their situation, <laughs> I mean, it was grounds to negotiate, you know, and try to work things out. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Anybody been there before? <laughs> you're a professed believer, and you're on the verge of compromise. You're on the verge of worrying beyond how you should worry. You're on the verge of trying to work things out. But these three Hebrew boys, instead of trying to work things out, mm, and even instead of trying to worry about things, whew, these three Hebrew boys just kept doing what they had been doing. And y'all know what that was. Come on. They were worshiping God. Y'all know the story. I got to tell the story. Matter of fact, they got in trouble for worshiping God. Y'all missing what I'm saying. Y'all missing what I'm saying. They got in trouble for worshiping God. And guess what got them out of trouble? Yeah. Worshiping God. That's First Corinthians 10, 13. Whatever you get in of for me, you'll get out of it by me. See, 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 natural logic would have said compromise. Work things out. You know, uh, maybe y'all ain't never heard nobody. Well, what the Lord know my heart. <laughs> we, we, oh, King, we'll worship you, but, but God knows my heart. They just kept doing what they had been doing. And that was worshiping God. Y'all, I think that deserves just a moment of our attention this morning. That deserves just a moment of our attention this morning. If worship is not a way of life for you, watch this now, before you get in trouble, your worship is not going to be effective for you once you find yourself in trouble. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. If your worship ain't working for you before you get in trouble, don't look for it to work for you when you get in trouble. So these three Hebrew boys had to decide either to work out something to avoid their faith from being tested or to joyfully go through their test worshiping and trusting God and God only. Again, you know the story. They decided that they were going to worship God only, not to worry. Y'all not hear what I'm saying. And not to worry. You didn't hear what I said. Not all of them. I, 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 let me paint this picture for you one more time. There has been an oven heated up seven times hotter than it ever had been heated up before. The flames in the oven, wrenched from the pit of the oven, went outside the oven. And burn, whoo, and burn people up on the outside so that they know that when they go inside, what their fate was going to be. But, whoo, but they did not worry, and they didn't try to work things out. They just kept on 
keep on, keep on, Woo. just keep on worship him. Okay, here's the deal. Listen, even if God don't do it, that's what we got to give y'all. God, that's what we got to give y'all, even if he don't do it. It took me nine o'clock Friday morning to realize that even if he don't get me out of San Juan, Puerto Rico, he can get me out of San Juan, Puerto Rico, if he choose to. We got to be willing to worship him even if he won't do it or even if he don't do it. They trusted God to work things out. They didn't know how he would do it or even if God would do it, but they did what they did willfully and joyfully. I close with this. You may be going through a fire of some, watch this now, self-afflicted furnace. Let me make that plain for you. (laughs) You might be going (laughs) through the fire of some self-inflicted furnace, one that you started, a fire you're responsible for. (laughs) Or you may be going through one that someone else has heated up for you. But know this, whether it's a self-inflicted fire, whether it's a fire set by family, friend, or foe, know this, your worship of God can take the hot out of heat your worship of God can take the smell out of smoke because the text says not a hair on their head was sin and they didn't even smell like smoke. But the folk on the outside was burnt up. Uh, woo. You can't work the hot out of heat and you can't worry the smell out of smoke. But you can worship God in the fire and as a result, become fireproof. Your joyful worship of God can fireproof you from the hottest fires of mankind. When you are a genuine worshiper of God, it fireproofs you from the fires of your friends, family members who don't even have a relationship with God. When you worship God, God fireproofs you from every fire. When you worship God, stuff that folk meant for bad, God will what? Make it work out for you good. That's what Psalm 23 is all about. It's about fireproofing. Let me prove that in close. The fire of God will meet your spiritual needs. When the foolishness drains you of the spirit of God. In other words, uh, in the twin, there's some that spiritual needs, directional needs, emotional needs, physical needs, and eternal needs. What a fireproof of God will meet your spiritual needs when folks' foolishness drains you from the spirit of God. The fireproof of God will meet your directional needs when folk try and lead you and guide you the wrong way. The fireproof of God will meet your emotional needs when folk wrongly forecast your future. The fireproofing of God will meet your physical needs even when folk try and block them because God is not subject to the economy. And lastly, the fireproofing of God will meet your eternal needs. In other words, God promises that folk who will embrace James 1 and 2, they will, when they get to heaven and spend eternity with him, uh, it will be proof that God fireproofed them while they were on earth. I go over to my seat with this, but you just got to know this story. And I just love this part about it. You remember when they were in the fire pit and the angels in heaven looked around at God and said, God, what you going to do? God was going to dispatch one of them. I'm busterizing, but they couldn't get there quick enough. He looked at his fastest angel. He said, can you get there? He said, Lord, it take me about a second. He said, that's too long. Then he looked at another angel. I'm bossed around there. He said, can you get down there? He said, just give me a half a second. God said, well, that's too long. He said, well, God, if he can't get there and I can't get there, how about you? He said, well, if you look, I'm already there. God is already there in the troubles with you. Bless your heart.